hello and welcome back and as you're watching this i am currently enjoying a day off gallivanting around california after a week-long business trip to the northwest i actually left on that business trip on the day that last week's episode released so uh, i'm filming this video very ahead of schedule but also i leave for that business trip in like three days so i need a softball i need something that i can knock out pretty easy so i figured why not uh hook up an unknown color monitor to the deck rainbow something that's never been done before <laughs> I don't know why I chose that as my softball video, but <laughs> here we go. The deck rainbow here, we did a little bit of work on this in the previous episode, cleaned it up, got it going, and it looks and works absolutely beautifully. It is a proper triple boot system. It can boot into uh, MS-DOS, it can boot into CPM, both the 8086 version and the 8-bit version of CPM, meaning that it has both an 8086 and a Z80 inside of it and it also has VT100 terminal emulation mode. So we can use all three different things. Not only that, we can switch between the three very quickly. I was able to go from terminal mode on the PDP-1183 to MS-DOS to CPM, all in under a minute. So it's a pretty wild machine, but despite the name being Deck Rainbow, it's a purely monochrome machine. This little monitor on top is the VR201, and it is a pure monochrome monitor. But color graphics was actually possible on the Deck Rainbow. There is an extra expansion board that you can plug in called the Color Graphics Adapter. Uh, you just plug it in and you get color graphics, except for the fact that uh, we, we still are stuck with the monochrome monitor. So the machine itself is uh, capable of displaying color graphics, but they don't ever actually show up here. So I need to hook a color monitor up to this. Now there was a specific deck rainbow color monitor called the VR241, I believe, but I don't have one of those and those are not easy to find. They're pretty rare out there. However, I do happen to have one of these. Ugh. This is a Princeton UltraSync, and I got this from Mike down in Austin as part of the awesome PDP-11 kit that he hooked me up with. This was originally used with their PDP-11s through the Matrox QRGB card and the DEB41 card. These were used as kind of a combo. Uh, now, I want to use this with both the 1183 and the Deck Rainbow, but that's going to require a lot of really interesting and kind of custom hardware. So in the interim, I think we're just going to hook this up to the deck rainbow initially and test out some color graphics on it But that's a lot harder than it sounds. This is a really unique monitor I can't find any information about it anywhere online much less a manual because if we flip it around here On the back the only IO port is a DB 25 port and I have no clue what the pinout of that port is, which is going to make it really difficult to plug it into the deck rainbow, which has a 15-pin uh, output. So we need to figure out the pinout of the rainbow, and we need to figure out the pinout of the monitor, and then build a custom cable that goes between the two. Gets a little more difficult than that because we also have to figure out the pinout of the keyboard because the keyboard on the rainbow plugs into the monitor. So we have to build a custom cable that goes between this monitor and the keyboard all the way over to the rainbow. Now I think there might be some syncing problems. The deck rainbow is a sync on green and I have no idea if this accepts that or not. So this whole video might be a giant waste of time, but there's only really one way to find out and that's to get towards wasting that time. <laughs> so let's get to work. First things first, having a color monitor is completely pointless unless we have something that can display colors. And so sitting here in DOS, there's really not much we can do. We can do a directory listing and, uh, well, as you can see, there is some stuff on our uh, DOS disk here, but I don't think any of this is going to show color for us. However, if we hop over to the B drive and we do a directory listing on it, We can see that we have a, a couple of interesting files here. One of them is called Regis. And if we do Regis dim down here, as a Regis demo, uh, and run that, 
Well, this is a program specifically designed to showcase the color capabilities of the deck rainbow. And so this is our perfect litmus test as comparison between uh, what it looks like on black and white and what it looks like in color. Uh, now this machine is not very fast and so it draws stuff incredibly slowly. Now we're only seeing what I think is just one color. The other two colors of the RGB that it should be putting out are not being displayed at all. So this is not only an incomplete drawing, uh, but it looks like it's going slower than it actually is because we're not watching the other colors draw. That's really apparent on this one where we can see some of it uh, kind of disappears on the boxes there and then absolutely nothing gets drawn at all. So I'm actually really curious what's going to show up on this one. But in order to find out what is going to show up on this one, well, we got to get a color monitor hooked up. And this is our color monitor. As I mentioned, it is a Princeton Ultra Sync. That's pretty much the only information I can find out about it. Uh, over here on the side, you can see that that's where the power switch is. And there's a little button that says text. Not entirely sure what that button does. Uh, it might eliminate some of the colors to give you a sharper text signal out. There is a sticker on the top that says unclassified, non-sensitive. That sticker is 100% staying. Here on the other side, we have brightness and contrast controls, but it only gets interesting once we get around to the back. Here we've got that single DB25 connector. Uh, and then right above it, there is a little switch that says analog or TTL. This lets you select between uh, different types of color input, which I think is really fascinating. We also have another switch down here called color 16 and 64. Uh, there's also a size under over. I'm not really sure what this is for. Maybe it's something about over scanning or under scanning. Uh, and then we have our, our standard uh, controls here, vertical position, vertical size, horizontal position, and horizontal size. Uh, other than that, it's pretty uneventful on the back here. Now, before I spend a couple hours figuring out the pinout of this DB25 here, I do want to make sure that this uh, monitor at least still works. So I am going to plug some power into it, flip the power switch on, and hopefully we can see something on the screen. Now, I know that a bunch of people are going to hop into the comments and scream at me for not ripping it open and replacing every electrolytic capacitor in there. Uh, all I gotta say is m movie magic. Uh, just suspend your disbelief for a little bit. I already opened this up, I already inspected all the electrolytics, I already put it back together, and I've already turned power onto it all off camera like weeks ago. Uh, so, you know, just roll with it here. We're, we're making films. We're, we're having fun. Anyways, let, let's turn it on and see what happens. All right, yes, I did say movie magic. I did plug this in and test it, but uh, that was months ago and I haven't put any power into it since. So let's at least give it another shot here and, and see what happens. We should get a solid color coming up on the screen here. Uh, yeah, I heard a uh, high voltage kick in. There might be a whine on the uh, audio. I'm gonna try and cut that out and post. Uh, we should see a solid color coming up as the CR, boy, I can feel the static on it. That's fascinating. Uh, Maybe I need to hit the text button. Ah, there it goes. So the, ooh, the refresh rate of that is awful. That's hurting my eyes, but well, we do have some life out of the monitor. So we need to get a signal into the back of it to try to actually get some text or something displaying on the screen. That flickering is messing with me. So we'll try to turn that off. <laughs> uh, that's good, the monitor works. We can go on to the next step. All right, let's get this thing apart so we can figure out the pinout of that DB25. After loosening up the two screws on the top, I'll tip the monitor over onto its face. Fortunately, the uh, CRT is inset, so it sits nice and flat on the bezel instead. Uh, and then there's two more screws on the bottom. And with all four removed, the main housing slides right off. Now, this CRT hasn't had any power put into it for years, but you know, kids, be safe around CRTs, especially color ones. They have multiple kilovolts that will absolutely ruin your day. Uh, at any rate, I want to get the main PCB loose so I can then remove the side panel holding the IO PCB. And then to get that side panel off, there's about six or so screws holding it to the front bezel as well as the rest of the framework inside the CRT. And with all of those screws removed, we can finally tip the PCB out and disconnect all the cable connectors. And there's about five of these connectors as well. So it was a little fiddly to get them all loose. You have to get a couple loose first and then you can kind of rotate the PCB out of the way to get access to the rest. But finally, the PCB breaks free from its CRT prison. And I want to get the uh, IO PCB off of the metal backing plate 
so I can see the traces on the back of it. And there are four screws holding it in place, and then the whole thing slips free. And it's a surprisingly simple PCB. It seems most of the complexity is on the main uh, board that's still in the monitor. But we have good clean traces on this, and I can start reverse engineering the DB25 to figure out the pinout. All right, we've got something of a schematic going on here. Uh, pretty much everything went through that uh, giant push button. That was where every single line on the uh, DB25 input went to with the exception of like ground. Uh, so that made it a little easier to figure out because that push button had really good silk screen on it. So it was just a matter of uh, beeping it out and figuring out which ones went to where. And we definitely have TTL RGB and TTL RGB2, so that can give, I think, six bits for a total of uh, the 64 colors that they're going for. There's also three pins for RGB analog, and these overlap with the TTL pins, and so depending on which one you're selected, it selects the right one. Uh, where I'm getting confused is uh, vertical sync and horizontal sync. Um, near as I can tell, coming out of the uh, deck rainbow, I did some digging and found a pinout for the DB15 connector on it. And uh, it doesn't have any sync signals. It doesn't have a horizontal sync or vertical sync. It does sync on green. Uh, and given the fact that the Princeton monitor has separate vertical sync and horizontal sync signals, I'm inclined to think that that may not play nicely with sync on green, and it may require some additional circuitry to pull out that sync signal from the green signal and run it into the separate uh, sync signal inputs on here. Hopefully that's not the case, but the best way to find out is just to uh, build a cable and plug it in and see. And so in order to do that, I got some of these uh, DB25 to uh, little screw terminal breakout things. Uh, so our first cable is going to be uh, very janky with these guys here, but it should allow us to prototype things pretty easily. For the LK201, uh, we can see that on the DB15 connector here, there's just two pins for keyboard received data and keyboard transmitted data. Uh, the keyboard also needs a plus 12 and a ground, and those are available on this DB15. So we're going to have to uh, figure out which pins on here are plus 12 and ground, route those into the keyboard, uh, as well as the uh, transmit and receive data into the keyboard. And then we're going to run the RGB signals from uh, the output of the, the uh, rainbow into the input of the Princeton. I have no idea how this is going to work. I... <laughs> All right, let's see if we break something. Let's just plug stuff in and see what goes up in smoke. To make the cable, I'm just going to use some ribbon cable, and really this is not the best for video as the, the video signal should be shielded, but I'll interlace ground in between the signals to hopefully cut down on crosstalk. Still, this is just for prototyping. If it works, I'll ultimately make a proper cable with uh, soldered connectors and shields and whatnot. You know, do it upright. Uh, also, if you're curious about how to make this, I'll put the uh, real pinouts in the description below. All right, Jenky Cable's made up second time now. The first time I wired it up to TTL and then plugged it all in and realized that's not going to work because uh, after I double-checked, the uh, deck rainbow here, I think, is analog RGB. Um, so I've got it wired up to the analog portion of the Princeton monitor here. The monitor is on, and I essentially see this going one of three ways. The first is that everything works. It goes through its boot sequence, and it says keyboard error, which we should see displayed in the top left here. The uh, second most likely option is that absolutely nothing happens. Uh, and the third option is that we damage either something in the monitor or something in the rainbow. We're certainly not hoping for option three. We're aiming for option one. So let's flip the rainbow on and give it a shot. Uh, it's going to take the rainbow a little bit of time to warm up and get to the point of displaying keyboard error. If it's going to do it, it should read both of the drives. And then after it's done reading both of the drives, then we'll either get the full menu or keyboard error. Nada. <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> Okay, let's try this one more time, only this time I wired in the keyboard. Uh, figured maybe we can get to a menu or something just by doing it off of memory. Uh, so we'll flip the power on. We do see a little bit of action out of the CRT when I flip the power on. So that's maybe an indication that I've got something plugged in correctly.
Okay, it beeped, uh, which means that we're at the menu, uh, but we're not displaying anything. However, that does mean that the system is booted, so I should be able to boot off of the A drive by hitting A. Yeah, so we're going to be booting into MS-DOS now. Uh, I have no idea how long this is going to take because we're doing it without any indication of what's going on up here. Uh, but when it stops reading the drive, uh, it should be asking us for date and time. And we can skip through those by just hitting enter twice. Uh, so if I just hit um, enter, enter, we should now be at the A prompt. Uh, so let's switch over to the B prompt. We'll do B colon enter. And then we'll do a directory on B. We should see the bottom drive read. That's good. <laughs> the fact that we're doing this totally blind uh, is a little strange, but the reason is is that I want to get to something that is absolutely displaying color just to see if there's any life here uh, And that Regis demo was it so we'll do R E G I S D E M. I'm pretty sure it was just D E M uh, It is reading the drive although it could just be searching for my misspelled file Whoa, we got life rainbow Regis 1983 <laughs> That's awesome. It should be drawing. Yeah, there we go. It's drawing stuff in blue. Well, we definitely got it doing something, but it's not quite there. But this is good news. This shows that this CRT should be capable of working with the deck rainbow. We just got to figure out what we've got uh, hooked up incorrectly. It could just be something as simple as a cabling problem. Okay, I think I've cracked it. I did some more reading online and it turns out that the Deck Rainbow routes the green video pin to the monochrome video pin uh, when it's doing text-based stuff. So I just needed to change from pin 10 over to pin 12 on my connector on the back. And uh, I have a high confidence that this is gonna work. Uh, so we should see, yes! <laughs> Testing in the top left corner. That is text. That was not showing up before. Uh, ooh, the testing again. We should see it read the drives uh, coming up next. Yeah, there it goes. It's reading the drives. And there's our menu. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh man, that is awesome. All right, let's start from A here. And then we'll go ahead and switch over to the B drive and then we'll just run Regis Demo. Uh, I actually think it's Regis Dim, but maybe it deletes that O on the end. There we go, we're running. Monitor type is color. We're drawing our boxes in blue. That is awesome. This is incredibly slow. So what I'm going to do is just uh, speed up the video. Uh, so it's running at, I don't know, maybe 25 times speed, 50 times speed. I don't know. It's super slow. But I'll just uh, let it run so you guys can see the full colors. But right now, man, this looks like it is fully working. That went way smoother than I was expecting. It's sitting here churning away in full color graphics. I, I think it is, I can't see it. Yeah, looks like it's still working. That's good news. <laughs> so it's sitting here living up to its name as the rainbow displaying full color graphics and working perfectly. This is awesome. And I've had a bit of a think about the cabling issue that we ran into. I had RGB set up on, uh, well, RGB going into this one. But it turns out that if you want to do text display, you need to use the monochrome pin because it's just doubling up that monochrome pin for uh, the green display on this one. But that makes an interesting scenario possible because when we blindly navigated to the Regis demo without having any monochrome display at all, the Regis demo still worked and displayed red, green, and blue, which means that we could take that monochrome signal and run that back over to the VR201 and have a dual monitor setup. 
that would be really bonkers because you could have your full monochrome text display on one monitor and your full color graphics on the other monitor. But if you only have a single monitor set up, you need to move the green over to the monochrome and well, that's the current situation it's in. And honestly, I'm not gonna run a dual monitor setup on this because I'm out of room. I don't have any space for any more CRTs in here. The main reason I wanted to get color graphics set up on this one is because I really wanted to use this monitor, but there's no other space for it. So it had to replace an other monitor. And the best candidate was the VR201. And you know what? I think the result was absolutely worth it. This is awesome. Assuming it is still working. Yeah, Whew. whenever it goes quiet and I can't see the screen, I get a little nervous. <laughs> But it's working perfectly. I'm super happy with the way it turned out. And I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And I want to thank you so much for watching. And I hope to see you in the next episode.